Hi, my name is Virginia McDaniel and I'm a forestry technician and ESA certified ecologist with the Southern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service. And right now we're going to take a botany walk on the Cedar Creek Trail. All right, so we'll see, we'll see a couple of, of buttercups on the trail. And this one right here is the small flowered buttercup or ranunculus abortivus. Uh, if you look at the petals, these are actually pretty big petals for, for this plant. I usually see it with even smaller petals, barely more than a millimeter. Um, so that one's really pretty. Um, evidently, it can be used, you can smash up the roots and it can be used for counteracting poison or for sore muscles. Um, it's also called the kidney-leaved crowfoot because the, the basil leaves, well, these aren't really super kidney-shaped, but they a lot of times that species can have kidney shaped. All right, so this is this is another species of, of buttercup or ranunculus. And as you can see, this one has a lot bigger petals than the, the, the previous one we saw. It also has divided leaves at the base. And this is also a species not to be mistaken with the ones that you see covering pastures. That's a non-native non -native species. This is a native that, as you can see, is much, much more well-behaved. All right, so another one of my favorite uh, spring ephemerals is this rue anemone, Thalictrum thalictroides. Um, it's You'll find it on stream terraces and rich woods, rich music woods. And one of the cool things about it is its dispersal mechanism. So the seeds of the ruin enemy have a little structure called an eliosome, which is rich in fat and protein. And it's attractive to ants. The ants take the seeds, they bring it back to their nest, and then they, they feed the eliosome to their young, and then they throw the seed out in their trash pile with, you know, ant frass and other, other substances that make it a perfect place for the seeds to germinate. So this is one of the many spring ephemerals that's, that's ant dispersed. All right, so this species, this species here is um, river cane, or Arundinaria gigantea. It's in the grass family, so it, it looks like bamboo, but it's a lot smaller in stature, and it's not as aggressive. It has its habitat where it's found. And historically, a lot of these um, areas were called cane breaks, and they were acres and acres along, along streams and provide a habitat for a lot of different animals. Um, but now, as you can see, when there's you know, just little, little bits of it. All right, so, so one way you can tell that the native cane from the river cane is the stipule of the native cane falls off. It's, it's deciduous, you know, like, like hardwood trees. Anyway, that's, whereas on the, the non-native, it'll, the stipule will stay on. So this plant is called partridge berry or Mitchell repens, and it's got opposite leaves. It's a vine that kind of just grows along, along the ground. But what makes it really cool is if you look at this berry up close, you see it looks like a blueberry, but it has two crowns. You can see that. Um, so when it, when it grows, it has two white flowers that come out, and then the ovary fuses into one berry. So that's kind of a little, little cool thing about the partridge berry. So this is um, sweet gum or liquid ambar styrasa flua. You can see it has leaves that <coughs> kind of look like a maple, but almost more more star shaped. I guess this is the the flowering stalk of of <coughs> sweet gum, which is pretty cool. You don't always see this, and it is the host plant for one of our largest moths, the Luna moth. So that's kind of cool. So May apples are another sh true sign of spring, Podophyllum peltatum. And if you look at them closely, you'll notice that some of the May apples have just one leaf that looks like an umbrella like this. 
and these are the, the not fertile ones. And then you'll have other May apples that have two leaves. And in between those two leaves, you'll see that there's a flower that comes out. And if you have the opportunity, you should definitely, when it flowers, you should definitely smell the flower. It is one of the most delectable, delicious smells that you'll smell. I don't know if you've heard, you know, we all need to, you need to stop and smell the May apples, right? You need to start that. <laughs> um, but don't eat it because the mayapple is toxic. It has a substance called podophyllin in it that's, a, that's uh, used to treat plant, in the treatment of planter's warts. Um, <clears throat> but another cool thing, going back to the, to the fruit of the mayapple, is that if you'll notice, the fruit, the flower, kind of leans over a little bit. And as it becomes a flower and a fruit, the fruit is a little bit heavier, and the fruit leans over a little bit more just to about the height of a box turtle's head. So the box turtles eat the fruits and they are a main dispersal, dispersal mechanism <laughs> of, of the May apple. So May apples often form these really large colonies, often, often circular. All right, and here we have sessile leaved bellwort, or Uvularia sessilifolia. And what sessile means is that the leaf is right on the stem, but there's no stalk to it. And you can see we've got a nice, here's a, has a light, very light yellow flower. There's three species in Arkansas, and um, one, of them, one of them is a rare species, and it, it, you can tell it because it has a perfoliate leaf, and that basically means that the stalk, the stem, goes right through the middle of the leaf. Um, but this one, this one is, is not the rare one, but a, still a very beautiful plant. So this is um, bed straw, or gallium aparine. It's actually in the same family with coffee, and it's got all these hooked hairs on it so that you can take it and you can attach it to somebody. And my daughter likes to go out in the yard and pick that and then come and throw it on me. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. And the reason why it was called a bed straw, evidently, was because it kind of sticks together and so people used it to, to fill their mattresses. All right, so toothwort is another uh, plant that is really wonderful to see after a, after a long winter, but it's also really nice to see because it's an indication that the area hasn't been heavily disturbed by humans because it's one of the first plants to go if, if an area is disturbed. Um, <clears throat> the name tooth comes from the, the rhizome, looks kind of like a tooth, and wart comes from the name. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed that there's a lot, a lot of different plants that, that have wart in them, spider wart, louse wart, liver wart. Um, wart actually means plant in Old English, so now that all those names make sense. Sorry. All right, so we popped off the trail for a little adventure, and what we found was pretty cool. It's not in flower, but this leaf right here is of a, a wonderful spring ephemeral called the bloodroot, or Sanguinaria canadensis. Now, if it did have, a, if it did have a flower, and if the leaf were a little bit bigger, what you'd see is the leaf wraps around the flower, and then, <clears throat> and it, and it, it keeps it warm because the bloodroot comes up in the in the winter before it gets before when the temperatures are you know, sometimes freezing at night. So that leaf provides a little bit of extra warmth while that bud <coughs> develops. And then when the flower eventually gets warm enough, that flower comes up above the leaf and flowers. The, other, the reason why it has the name bloodroot is because the rhizome, or the root, is reddish in color and it has a reddish sap. And actually, evidently, the entire plant has a reddish sap. Shall we check it out? Let's look. Let's just take a little piece off this blood root. We're not going to hurt it too much. And then 
Let's look real close and see if we can see red sap coming up. Oh, we can see it. It's got little, it looks like it's, it's bleeding. It's so red. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Alright, so this, this plant right here is called rattlesnake fern, and it is a fern ally. So it reproduces with spores. It doesn't have real flowers, it, it has spores. Um, and this is the, the species uh, Botrychium virginianum that, that comes out in the spring. And there's another species that the leaves are, are not <coughs> as dissected as this, that will come out in the fall, Botrychium bitternatum. All right, and this fern right here is Christmas fern. And why it is Christmas fern is because each of these little leaflets look like a little stocking. <laughs> so the leaves, the leaves over winter, they often help with erosion. Um, ero you know, they collect a bunch of leaf litter and whatnot. But you can see right here, the new leaves are coming out. The new leaves unfurl called, it's called circinate vernation as they unfurl themselves. So those are called fiddleheads. And um, up in the northeast, a lot of people, a lot of people eat fiddleheads. You know, it's a popular thing to collect. But they have, they have a lot more ferns than we do down here in Arkansas. And um, the Christmas fern, I don't know, it just seems a little bit hairy. I've never really wanted to eat it. All right, so I'm not going to put my hand too close to this, this plant here. It's uh, poison ivy, toxicodendron radicans. And you guys are all probably familiar with the leaves of three, let them be. When they're just coming out, they're super shiny. Um, I know I get poison ivy pretty bad. Apparently, there are 15% of the people that don't have an allergic reaction. But what causes the allergic reaction is it has this oil called arushial oil. And when it gets on your skin, it prevents your cells from communicating with the lower cells. And so then because they're not communicating, they assume it's a foreign body and they need to attack it. And so that's what causes the allergic reaction with poison ivy. All right, so right here we have the common blue violet, which is Viola sororia. You'll find it in, in, in nice woods. You'll also find it in your lawns. It grows a lot of different places. Um, but one thing that makes it cool is that it is the host plant of the state butterfly of Arkansas, the Diana fritillary. And so that, that kind of brings up another point because we all are familiar with the monarch, right? Monarchs need milkweed because that's what their larvae, that's what their caterpillars eat. Well, what we fail to understand is that every moth, every butterfly, every insect also has a particular host plant or a group of plants, like the spicebush swallowtail. It needs sassafras or spicebush to survive. Like that's what its, its caterpillars, the larvae, eat. And if we don't have spicebush or we don't have sassafras, we lose the spicebush swallowtail. So, <clears throat> and the other thing to consider is that non-native plants are they don't provide any food. The, the, our, our native insects don't recognize those non-native plants as food. So you might as well, if you're going to plant Nandina, you might as well plant a plastic flower because that's, that's all it's doing for, the, for the, your, the ecology. It's not providing, not getting anything back. So anyway, so that's the common blue violet. <laughs> Thank you. 
here is one one of my my favorite um, spring ephemerals. This is called Spring Beauty or Claytonia virginica, and the genus memorializes an early English uh, or colonial botanist John Clayton, and the species epithet virginica is for the state where it was collected in the Virginia province. Um, you can see the exquisite pink pink veins in the petals. They kind of guide the pollinators to the pistil and stamens. Um, the whole plant is edible from this, these grass-like leaves, um, the flowers, down to a little, little tuber at the base, which is about the size of a marble. And it gets, a, it gets another common name called the fairy spud <laughs> from that little tuber that was, was eaten by Native Americans and, and other folks. The plant we have here is purple wood sorrel. Wood sorrel. It's called Oxalis violacei. It's get, it gets its genus name Oxalis for the Greek word meaning sour, and it is very tart to eat um, <clears throat> because it has oxalic acid in it. And the one interesting thing about the plant is there's little the undersides of the leaves are often purple, and so the jury's out a little bit as to why the underside of the leaf would be purple. But one, one thing I've read is that <clears throat> it helps the plant to absorb more wavelengths of light. So if you see a green plant, that means that plant is absorbing every wavelength except for the green. That's what it's reflecting. And so if the underside is purple, then that means that it's, <clears throat> it's able to absorb the green light and reflect the purple. And so that kind of allows the plant to absorb more wavelengths of light and get more, more energy to make more food. So, so there's also there's also a yellow wood sorrel, and I know as a kid I used to when mom would send me down to the garden to pick <clears throat> pick the lettuce, I'd often put a little bit of that yellow wood sorrel in the in our salad mix. It adds a little a little spice to it. So, yeah. All right, so this little gem of a spring plant is called um, wild ginger, or Asarum canadensis. And so the genus Asarum is found here, and then in China, Japan, and Vietnam. Um, and there are actually a lot of, a lot of genera, like uh, the tulip tree, Liriodendron, and hickories are found here and in Asia, because uh, the, the, the climate is pretty similar. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but this one, we have the joy of a flower. I don't know if you can see this beautiful maroon flower. The color of this flower and the smell of this flower attract gnats and flies. It doesn't smell particularly good. Um, and the, this flowers in the early spring when the gnats and flies are searching for thawing carcasses. Mm. Anybody want to smell this flower? <laughs> So here we have a trillium, or the sessile trillium, also called toad shade. Um, the scientific name is Trillium sessile. So it gets the, the genus from um, the Latin word for trace, which means three. And as you can see, it's got three leaves. It also, if the if the flower were open right here, it's got three sepals and three petals. Um, <clears throat> it's also another, just like, um, remember the windflower? It has eliosomes, so it is also an ant dispersed species. All right, so here we have a plant in the aster family. It's called cress leaf groundsel. So it kind of has these dissected leaves that kind of look like watercress. Um, <clears throat> it's also called butterweed because of these bright yellow flowers that look like butter. You find this particular species in really wet areas and you can tell it from the other, other groundsels because it has a hollow stem. If you squish it, it's, it's hollow. You'll see another one as I was driving here. You'll see an, another um, Pachyra species growing along the, along the roadsides. 
um, Pacaratomentosa that has more of a grayish green leaves, kind of has a little bit of woolly, woolly hairs on it. Um, <clears throat> so Pacara actually has this, these toxic alkaloids called pyrolizidine that are toxic to mammalian liver. So deer, deer and rabbits completely avoid this plant. Cows are not quite as savvy and sometimes they eat it there by poisoning themselves. That's really terrible. <laughs> but anyway, it's also, it's one of the, the few um, asteraceous plants or plants in the composite family that bloom this time of year. And I'm going to do a little, talk a little bit about the flower of a composite. Uh, in the composite family. So you guys all look at this flower and you think, this is a flower, but actually it's not. It's about 50 flowers. This whole thing is called an inflorescence. And these petals are actually, each one of these petals is a ligule flower, or sorry, a ray flower. And then inside are what are called disc flowers. So as you can see, there's probably a hundred, a hundred flowers in this, in this plant. And that's the reason why it's called the composite family, because it's a composite of these ray flowers and disc flowers. That's kind of cool. So I also, I also just, I also just picked a dandelion flower because I was going to talk about um, the different kinds of flower. Now the dandelion flower has all ray flowers. It doesn't have any disc flowers. So all these, all the different flowers in this flower are, are ray flowers. So Marla just asked me what this plant was and I was, I was momentarily stumped. I couldn't think of it. And then I remembered the trick. One thing, it's, it's got opposite leaves, right? It's got opposite branches. Opposite branches should lead you to, to four different plants called Mad Dog Buckeye. Maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeye are the four typical um, sh like tree woody plants. Well, not woody plants, but <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh, trees that are opposite. There are more than that, but, but those, are, those are some of the main ones. So anyway, so that made me think, you know what? I think it's a dogwood. And then I did the dogwood trick, which is if you take the leaf and you break it, and it hangs on by a little cottony vein, that means it's a dogwood. All right, so we've got, we've got a couple of kinds of dogwood here. Um, this one I just keyed out to be the swamp dogwood. And then this one's the dogwood you're probably more familiar with, the flowering dogwood that you see flowering in the, <clears throat> in the woods so beautifully in the spring and in people's yards. But one thing to realize about the flowering dogwood is that these white things that you think of as petals are actually bracts. And the flowers of the dogwood are found in, inside. So this, in fact, has, you know, 15 or 20 flowers surrounded by these, these white bracts. Um, but the swamp dogwood has much smaller, well, it doesn't have the bracts, first of all, and the flowers are, are similar size. <clears throat> but it has these, these umbel-shaped flowers, and it grows, as you can see, right in the middle of a, a creek bed, hence the name swamp dogwood. All right, well thank you guys for coming with me on this walk on the Cedar Creek Trail. I hope you learned a few, a few of the spring ephemerals and, and maybe you'll recognize some of them and they'll become your friends too.